When we look at metabolic dysfunction, we like to just think of, ah, we're overweight, things aren't working really well. But when you really look at metabolic dysfunction, it's not just about being obese or overweight. It's about being obese or overweight plus hyperglycemic, having high blood glucose. It's also about having hyperlipidemia where your lipids are all out of whack, cholesterols are all out of whack. It's also about being pre-diabetic or having insulin resistance. And it also even factors in cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of things that we need to be looking at. But one of the most important things that seems to be a big root of metabolic dysfunction is the mitochondrial dysfunction. And there's ways that we can kind of keep our finger on the pulse of it a little bit and I'm gonna get into that, but it's very, very interesting stuff. In fact, the Institute of Biotechnology at the University of Helsinki indicates that mitochondrial dysfunction could be the root of so many different diseases. So mitochondria are more than just the energy powerhouses, right? They're more than just that. Okay? They play a role in metabolic dysfunction and potential metabolic syndrome. Because when our mitochondria are dysfunctional, they don't just produce less energy. When our mitochondria are dysfunctional, they produce more oxidative stressors. They produce more reactive oxygen species. Because they are the engine in our cells, they are responsible for creating that energy, right? For giving us the, the energy, the ATP. But if that engine is dirty and not working properly, it's gonna create a lot of excess exhaust and that triggers a lot of oxidative damage. That can affect our aging acceleration, that can absolutely have an impact on our ability to process fuels, so it can impact insulin resistance, it can impact uh, prediabetes, all these things that are very important that we need to be paying attention to. And maybe it's all starting at the mitochondrial level. So if we have an inefficiency in the mitochondria's ability to process fuel, okay, if it can't, take electrons and create fuel out of it properly, what's going to happen? Well, for one, you're gonna have less energy. Number two, you're gonna have more mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. Okay, that's gonna be more oxidative stress. But as a result of that, that actually damages the mitochondria more. And when the mitochondria get damaged, they leak particles. And when they leak particles, you have an increase in what's called damage-associated molecular patterns. This means that the immune system has to deal with this damage. And this damage that's associated naturally with aging, but even more so with metabolic dysfunction, well, this is going to trigger an inflammatory response. When you have an inflammatory response, well, you can start listing off the potential problems that occur, right? This can definitely have an effect metabolically. More inflammation can lead to well, more insulin resistance, it can lead to hyperglycemia, it can lead to less ability to utilize nutrients properly. Now, again, there's things that you can do to monitor this. We have to look at it like this, okay? Our mitochondria are constantly bombarded with fuel. We're not supposed to always have fuel on hand. Now, this doesn't just mean overeating. It means the instance of higher levels of blood glucose too, like consistently eating and keeping our blood glucose levels high. That's not really supposed to happen. When we have consistently high levels of fuel, the mitochondria try to put a stop to it. There's actually some evidence that the reactive oxygen species, the oxidative stressors that are produced in the mitochondria, there's some theory that that entire process happens in an essence to stop too many nutrients from coming in, okay? So basically what happens, the mitochondria becomes dysfunctional so as a result, it says, well, I'm going to increase insulin resistance to make sure that this cell doesn't get more fuel because if it gets more fuel, it's gonna cause a bigger problem to the body. So in a lot of ways, the insulin resistance is protecting damaged mitochondria from releasing more reactive oxygen species. It actually could be protecting a situation because we are so bombarded with nutrients. One of the best ways to kind of modulate the negative effects of mitochondrial dysfunction is to put yourself in a deficit, in a caloric deficit, or to abstain from high glucose for a while so that from an energy standpoint, glucose standpoint, you are in a deficit. What this does is it elevates what's called AMPK. When you elevate AMPK, 
Well, AMPK phosphorylates and it triggers the expression of PGC1A. Downstream from that, you have more mitochondria that form. So imagine this, you have crappy little mitochondria that aren't doing a good job producing cruddy energy and lots of oxidative stressors. Well now all of a sudden you have gene expression that's saying, oh, let's go ahead and let's break this cruddy mitochondria down and create better mitochondria that can process energy better, that might have an impact on how glucose is utilized. One of the ways that you can kind of manage this and take a good look at it is by continually monitoring your glucose. So I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I put a link down below for Cygnos. They are not just a way for every person to get a continuous glucose monitor, but they provide the really interesting insight to allow you to do something with that data. So yes, I can look at my phone and I can get in real time my glucose readings. And I can see, hey, is my glucose too high? Am I potentially triggering mitochondrial dysfunction? I can look at that and I can get a snapshot of that but it also has really unique algorithms to look at my trends, look at what I eat, and provide me with the insight to say, hey, your glucose is trending high, it's spiking high. In order to prevent fat accumulation or potential damage, you should go for a walk, or you should do some squats, or do some push-ups. It gives me tips so that when I'm going throughout my life, I get on demand things that tell me your glucose is high. Now I'm not saying that high levels of glucose are the only trigger for metabolic dysfunction, but at a mitochondrial level, it is about nutrient sensing. It is about our cells being able to recognize, hey, there's too much glucose, so now we start incurring damage, right? So I did put a link down below for Cygnos. That way you can try them out and you'll save 20% off when you use that link. So it's cool, you end up having like a quick telehealth consult that allows you to get your hands on a continuous glucose monitor, which isn't easy to do in the first place. So you actually get a real continuous glucose monitor with like a Dexcom device, right? And then you get the Cygnos app that allows you to do all these cool things. So really, really cool opportunity. So that link is down below. Again, use that code on the screen right now and try that link out after this video. One of the things that we also don't associate with metabolic dysfunction or mitochondrial dysfunction is how these higher levels of glucose and things like this can affect us from an aging perspective too. Okay, this is very important to look at because if we are bombarded with super high levels of glucose all the time or just super high nutrients in general, like overloading of nutrients, too many calories, too much glucose, things like that, things we can monitor. If we're constantly bombarded with that, well, what happens is you have an increase in what is called the NAD to NADH ratio. This means that most of your electron carriers that would normally carry energy and all that, they're all occupied dealing with fuel. Now that sounds fine, right? Because NAD, basically an electron carrier, it's occupied doing its job moving fuel. But from an aging perspective, when NAD is not moving fuel, it is activating sirtuins. Okay, now let me put that in simple context. When sirtuins get activated, it increases our mitochondrial biogenesis because sirtuins also regulate mitochondrial physiology. So when we have less fuel, less sugar, less glucose, less calories, we have more available NAD that can activate a sirtuin that then creates better mitochondria. But it also doesn't just do that. It also triggers the expression of what's called FOXO3, which sounds like complicated gobbledygook, but it's really pretty simple. FOXO3 is known as the longevity gene because it influences antioxidant production inside our bodies. Well, what does this have to do with everything? Well, imagine this. Imagine your mitochondria is dysfunctional and you're not creating good energy, so you're creating a lot of reactive oxygen species, a lot of oxidative stress. If FOXO3 is expressed, you're producing more in the way of these natural antioxidants that can deal with that stress. It allows you to get a grip on the problem but you can't really get a grip on the problem unless you are monitoring your nutrient intake and managing your glucose levels. Because again, if you're bombarded with fuel all the time and you're insulin resistant, the cells are just going to continue, the mitochondria is just gonna to continue to get more and more dysfunctional, produce, you're gonna just downward spiral. 
Just to give you context into how much insulin resistance plays a role in mitochondrial dysfunction, it is estimated that in people that are insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic, that PGC1A expression is decreased 90%. Remember, PGC1A is what allows for new mitochondria to form. So that is attenuated, decreased by 90% in people that are insulin resistant or are type 2 diabetic. So obviously they would have high levels of blood glucose too. This means that it is more difficult to produce new mitochondria when you are insulin resistant. And it has all to do with, again, overloading this nutrient sensing. The only way that we could possibly get a grasp on this that I can personally think of is to start bringing ourselves into a deficit so that we phosphorylate AMPK, bring ourselves into lower glucose states so we can phosphorylate more AMPK and increase the NAD to NADH ratio. But I have a few other ways that you could do this. Okay, so number one, put yourself in a deficit. Not all the time, but as much as possible. Intermittent fasting, things like that. Those are very powerful tools to create an energy deficit. Energy deficits are not just about losing weight. It triggers cellular changes and more mitochondria. Again, I hope that's getting across how important that is. Number two, exercise, which, okay, we know this, right? But if you were to be wearing a continuous glucose monitor, for instance, and you were to exercise, you could watch what happens to your glucose. This is another direction to activate AMPK. It's another direction to go through mitochondrial adaptation. You get these chronic adaptations that occur, including PGC1A deacetylation, which means more PGC1A being activated means more mitochondria. So caloric deficit or fasting, but on a separate occasion outside of just that, exercise, exercise a lot and try to get that level up, get that number up. Carnitine, supplementing with carnitine can also be beneficial. It does this because it helps remove the acyl coenzyme A toxic buildup. And what that simply means is that it allows some of the toxic buildup in the mitochondria to be removed. It sort of acts as a shuttle and that allows a already damaged mitochondria to maybe restore itself and get a little bit better. Now carnitine can also help suppress some of the fatty acid induced membrane damage that can occur. So carnitine is heavily published and I know it's a supplement, you don't have to do it, but I do recommend the occasional utilization of carnitine. But you can also kind of increase your carnitine availability by occasionally going on like a ketogenic diet or doing lower carb now and then. Again, not something you have to do, something just to mention. The next one is increasing glutathione levels in your body. Now you do this naturally in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of glutathione supplementation. Eating sulfur rich foods, so things that are rich in like uh, methionine, right? So methionine uh, rich meats, so that's going to be fish, that's going to be beef or rich in methionine. That's very good for glutathione production. Okay, additionally, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those are really good sulfur containing vegetables that can drive up basically the conversion process. Glutathione needs sulfur to get activated. Uh, another thing you can do as a supplement, if you wanted to play around with it, is going to be coenzyme Q10. You can also eat foods that are rich in coenzyme Q10. So again, good, healthy, lean fishes, lean meats, things like that. So coenzyme Q10 <clears throat> acts like sort of a catcher's mitt so that when the electrons are going down their electron transport chain, they're not bouncing all over the place, creating reactive oxygen species. There's a larger mitt to catch them, so it sort of corrals the electron transport chain process so that there's less overall mitochondrial damage. So that's a good supplement if you're looking to add something like that in. Also, making sure you're getting enough magnesium. Again, either through supplement, but ideally through food whenever you can. It is a cofactor to catalyze a bunch of biochemical reactions that are involved in ATP production. So without magnesium, you can't really form ATP. So without magnesium, you have less efficient mitochondria. But by and large, the best thing that you can do is just overall control your nutrient intake and keep a firm grasp on your glucose and keep a firm grasp on how much you are eating. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.